So this is what I'm going to be talking about. What is radioactivity, or ionizing radiation, or sometimes just called radiation? Um, and I'm going to give a little bit of a background on uranium mining and the nuclear power generation, what happens in a reactor, etc. And then mainly about health and how does radioactivity affect living cells? What kinds of damage does it do? What kinds of diseases does it cause? Um, and some research around that. Um, a little bit about accidents. I think somebody in some of the ensuing um, lectures are going to be talking more about that and the effects of fallout from the above grounds nuclear testing from the 50s. And then to be complete, and also because I'm a physician, a, a bit about the, the radiation that, uh, is, that everybody gets when they have medical procedures. So what is ionizing radiation? So you have to go back to your grade 12 chemistry, your periodic table with all the elements. So every element has a certain number of protons, which are positively charged an equal number of electrons, which are negatively charged, so every atom is neutral. And then, usually around the same number of protons as neutrons. So, but every, some elements actually have different numbers of neutrons, so it's kind of the same element, it's called the same name, but the little number beside it is different, because we count up the protons and neutrons because they have mass. We don't count the electrons because they don't have mass. But anyway, so some elements have isotopes, of one or two or three other isotopes. It's the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. And some of these, most of these actually are what we call stable, but some of them are unstable. And we call those radioactive. And what that means is they have this propensity to kind of shoot off little bits of themselves, subatomic particles, often a couple of protons and a couple of neutrons. Um, and sometimes they shoot off high energy photons. And, and when they do that, they actually turn into another element. And if that element is radioactive, then it will shoot off little bits of itself to become another one. And it'll, if that one's radioactive, it keeps going down what we call the decay chain. Each one is called a daughter or a progeny or a decay product until it reaches something stable. So this is an example. The top left, you can see uranium-238. That's an isotope of uranium. There's 238, 235, and 234, but they're all uranium. So this is the decay chain for uranium-238. So there are three kinds of radioactive emissions. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. This is an alpha emitter, and what happens is it throws off a couple of protons and a couple of neutrons, and then it becomes thorium-234, which is actually four numbers less because those two alpha, two uh, protons and two neutrons, they, there are four of them, so the, the atomic mass changes. And then thorium-234 is itself radioactive. It, it throws off, it's a beta emitter and a gamma emitter. That's, those are just kind of different amounts of energy they give off. And then it becomes protactinium-234. And each of these all the way down is radioactive. And it shoots off little bits of itself, becomes the next one until it reaches lead 206, which is stable. So every atom of U238 has to go down this decay chain until it becomes lead 206. It's continuous and it's irreversible. On the right, those bars show the half-life. So the half-life is if you take a certain amount of U238, how, how long it takes for half of it to have turned into thorium-234. So the half-life of U-238 is very long. It's four and a half billion years. Some of these are very short, going into the minutes, and that polonium-214 is 160 microseconds, so it's hardly that for very long, and then it throws off a little bit, and then it becomes the next one. It takes about 10 half-lives for a certain amount of a radioactive substance to kind of totally disappear. So, the second to the bottom of that list was polonium-210. It's very, very radioactive, very toxic. This man is Alexander Litvinenko, and he was a Russian KGB uh, member, became very unpopular in Russia, and moved to the UK 
and continued his work and then was murdered in 2006. He was poisoned with polonium-210. The tiniest little bit was put into his tea and he immediately got acute radiation sickness. This is him just before he died a couple of weeks later. And it is, he's considered the first person to die of radiation terrorism. Interestingly, Yasser Arafat, who died in 2004, was also, there was, after a while, he had a very unusual illness and then died quite quickly. And there was a lot of talk a few years later that he was also poisoned with polonium-210. And to the point where they actually exhumed his body a couple of years ago, and it's still very mysterious what he actually died of. So, this whole nuclear en energy and nuclear weapons story starts with uranium, which is a metal. <coughs> Most of the uranium in Canada comes from, um, nor it comes, is in northern Saskatchewan, a little bit in Ontario, around Elliott Lake, and a little bit around Bancroft. There are only a few countries that have a lot of uranium, Kazakhstan, uh, Niger, um, Australia, um, and Canada is a big exporter of uranium. So mostly what's in the earth, the, the rock I should say, is U-238 with a tiny little bit of 235. So <coughs> uranium mining isn't any different than any other mining. It's a great big hole that we dig and then we take out the rock using, uh, well then we crush it and then using different methods and chemicals we extract the uranium and that is yellow cake, it's sort of a yellow powder. Then it's taken to Blind River where it's refined into a form that is the first step to making, uh, to using uranium in our reactors. Then if it stays in Canada, it goes to Port Hope where there's, it, it's converted into a uh, mixed with fluorine and you end up with, a, with a, a product that then is made into pellets which are made into fuel bundles which go in the reactor. If it's going to the states, it goes to be enriched and what that means is that they, they for their reactors, they don't use can do reactors like we do. Their reactors use U-235 so they need to take that, they need to extract out the U-235 from the whole bunch which is mostly 238 and they do that with various methods. Um, now, one thing I'm, I want to mention here is they end up with some extra U-238, quite a bit of extra, and it's a waste product. They, because U-238 is very, very dense and hard, they use it on the outside of bullets and around tanks. It's called depleted uranium, and, and these are depleted uranium weapons. And they've been used in the Gulf War, in the Balkans, in Iraq, and in Afga Afghanistan. And there is... Nobody's really studied it, but soldiers coming back are having some mysterious illnesses, possibly higher rates of certain cancers like lymphoma, and um, some people will attribute it to the DU, depleted uranium. What's also of great concern is the people living in these war-torn places who are living in this little bit of uranium, DU dust. The bullet casings all over the place, the burnt out tanks that have DU, in them on the outside. The um, depleted uranium, when it's on impact, it creates, it combusts and creates a very fine dust. And when you inhale it, it's so fine, it actually will go and lodge in your lungs, but actually will go into your circulation, into your organs. And it's radioactive. And once it's in there, it has to go down, every atom of it has to go down that chain. So um, that's the concern about it causing illness in people who are exposed to it. So uranium mining, what are the health effects? Well, it's been mined for many centuries and it's been known that uranium miners, they used to call it, um, I think, mountain disease, but it was a, uh, they kind of build a little wall around it too, but truthfully, a lot of it gets into the water and the air and the soil. You can't contain it. But they have done a good job with a lot of the abandoned mines of, they try and remove the toxic tailings and they cover it all up. And in fact, they turn it into parkland, et cetera. It's, it's the reclamation process. Um, <coughs> now, what happens inside a reactor? So you have your fuel bundles, which go into this big, big uh, container, this silo, which we call a reactor. So it contains the uranium. They bombard it with neutrons. This breaks apart those atoms of uranium 
into, um, uh, and that, so they, they release more neutrons, which then split up more. So it's, it's a fish, it's a non-ending self-sustaining cycle. Um, so if this is totally uncontrolled, it just creates a huge amount of heat because when the atoms split, they, they give off a bit of heat. Every, every one of them gives off heat and energy. If, they, if this is uncontrolled, it's, there's a massive blast, blast with a huge amount of heat, and that's what a nuclear bomb is. But if you control it, which we do in our nuclear reactors, neutron absorbing, moderating materials, and constantly cooling it, you'll create heat, which we use to boil water, and the steam pushes turbines, which produce electricity. And it's actually quite a brilliant technology. So, I mentioned there's alpha, beta, and gamma emissions. So when the fuel rods go in, they are mostly gamma, alpha emitters. And what that means is those two, alpha, those two protons and neutrons, when the uranium atom throws them off, alpha emission, they, they don't, it, it won't go through you. It's non-penetrating. So you can actually hold a fuel bundle in your hand, and it won't hurt you. Um, but when they come out, they've got all these broken apart uranium atoms, they've got all these fission products, um, and 200 new human-made products that you don't find in nature. One of them is plutonium. Plutonium itself is used in some reactors in other places in the world. Um, and you can take it out of the fuel, the spent fuel, um, through a, quite a toxic process, actually, with a lot of chemicals. But they call that recycling the fuel to be used as a reactor fuel. But it is also what's used in a nuclear bomb. And that is the link between the nuclear energy industry and nuclear weapons, is the plutonium, for the most part. Um, and that's why a lot of countries don't want a country like Iran to have nuclear energy, because they think it's just an excuse to produce plutonium to make a bomb. Anyway, so once the, fuel, the spent fuel rods are taken out, they're very, 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 very hot. You have to cool them, and you put them in big sort of like swimming pool looking um, boxes basically, run cold water around them constantly for between seven and ten years until it's cool enough to do something with. So what they do now, what we do, is we just put them in sort of concrete silos and leave them there. It's called dry storage. Because nobody has ever figured out what to do with nuclear waste. So that's basically what we, we, we're doing. And on the sites of our, of our reactors, so that's Bruce in the um, um, Western Ontario, Pickering and Darlington, and then Point La Pro out in New Brunswick. Um, they're just sitting there, 40,000 uh, tons of it. And continuing to accumulate as I, as, we, as I speak. Now this is a picture of the lung of some kind of monkey. So in the middle there, you can see a black thing with a bunch of lines coming out of it. That's a particle of plutonium. And you can see the trajectory of the, the um, uh, particles that are being shot off it. As you can see, it will damage the cells around it, the local tissue. So um, there's gamma radiation, which is similar to x-rays, where it's just a a line of energy basically that will go through you, it penetrates, and it damages cells along the way. But when you, when you stop the gamma ray, the damage stops, okay? It's different from the alpha <coughs> emission and the beta emission because, again, they're non-penetrating. They won't, it's not like a gamma ray which will go through you. It doesn't even penetrate hardly into your skin. But if you inhale it or ingest it, it goes and lodges in your tissue and shoots off those little particles, like that lung tissue. Plutonium is an alpha emitter, so th it's shooting off those protons and neutrons and damaging the cells close by. Um, polonium, U-238, and radon are all alpha emitters. They're internal emitters. Strontium-90, cesium-137, iodine-131, all from nuclear reactors. Um, they're all beta emitters, but these are internal emitters, so when they're in your body, they're there until they've gone down that whole decay chain um, and reached something stable. Not, it's continuous and not reversible. So the, what happens is those, the, the damage done is done to the different parts of our cells, but if it damages the nucleus where the DNA is, 
um, it causes illness. So acute radiation sickness is pretty well understood because anything acute, you can watch it happen, it happens quickly, you can measure it, and we, we understand that pretty well. What's less understood and much harder to study is the chronic low-level emissions that we are constantly being exposed to because that DNA damage can take a long time to manifest itself. But we know DNA damage causes cancer. We know it causes birth defects and miscarriage and stillbirth and immune problems, immune illnesses, autoimmune illnesses, diabetes. We know it speeds up atherosclerosis. And if, it, if the egg and sperm are affected, the egg and sperm lines, it will cause mutations, inheritable disease, which may take a few generations for enough of those mutations to build up in a population. Um, so that may not declare itself right away. The most susceptible tissues are the fast reproducing tissues. That is the bone marrow, which produces blood, the uh, egg and sperm, the gonads, and then embryonic tissue, fetal tissue, anything, because they're growing so quickly. Um, the GI tract, growing bones and cartilage, so prenatally and children, they're all very susceptible to radiation. The cancers, there are many cancers that are caused by radiation, particularly thyroid cancer and leukemia, particularly childhood leukemia. Now children are more susceptible because they're growing. Women are more radiosensitive than men and it's not really understood why. It's not just a question of size. Um, but women are more vulnerable. And again, for the internal emitters, it's once they're in you, it's irreversible and continuous. Every atom that is there has to go down that decay chain. And as it does it, it causes damage. Now, there's all of us all the time are exposed to background radiation. So a millisievert, that MSV, is just a measurement of uh, radioactivity. Averaged out in the world, it's, we are all exposed to 2.4 approximately millisieverts per year. And that varies depending on the geography and the altitude, etc. Um, <coughs> most of that is just rays from the sun and their gamma rays and radon, um, which is an alpha emitter. But a lot of it is also uh, what contributes is the nuclear power, the low level emissions that are constantly coming out of nuclear reactors the above grounds weapons testing from the 50s all over the world um, and all the nuclear accidents, large and small, have all contributed to increasing background radiation. And medical procedures also are large, uh, largely uh, what a lot of us are exposed to that increases our um, radio radiation exposure. And air travel, because we're up closer to the sun, so that increases the, uh, the, the radiation that we're exposed to. So the allowable levels, I mean, this has been from the beginning of understanding radiation 100 years ago, it's gone less and less and less and less and less to the point where now in Canada we are allowed 1.0 millisievert per year. That is considered an acceptable level um, for the public. Interestingly, we don't have the same uh, standards for people in the nuclear industry. They can have as much as 100 over five years, maximum 50 in one year. This translates to over three cases of fatal cancer per 100 workers over a 40 year career, which is very high um, compared to other uh, occupations, uh, considered what's considered acceptable risk. So you have to remember that the damage is cumulative. So the more exposure you have, the more risk you have. And this is important when you're talking about large populations because even low, ex low um, um, exposure to a large population for the radio sensitive people, you, you will see there will be people who will uh, develop illnesses, even from low exposures. And we have to decide what is an acceptable risk because there are risks to everything. And um, so the government at this point have decided that we, 1.0 millisieverts per year for the public is an acceptable risk. Now, when you study this, it's, it's very hard to sort out what is reliable study and what isn't. And you have to keep in mind when you read about, and this is true for anything, 
when you read there is a study that showed this or that, you really have to look at the study yourself. You have to know some epidemiology. You have to see if it's what the limitations are of the study, what's reliable, what isn't, and make up your own mind. And it's you need a certain knowledge to do that. Um, so just to keep in mind, when you do read about anything, and including radiation, you have to uh, keep an open mind about the limitations of the study. The Alera principle is what most, most regulatory agencies go by, which is as low as reasonably achievable. And that means you keep, you keep the acceptable risk, you keep the risk as low as you can. Um, in Canada, it's the CNSC, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, that oversees all of our, uh, everything radio, ra radiation-wise in Canada. And generally speaking, they're, they're quite a pro-nuclear organization. And I, just to be complete, I want to talk about this. It's the whole idea that a small level of, uh, that's it, not just for radiation, but that something that is harmful at very, very low doses may actually be beneficial. Um, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it, it may, you know, you can't dismiss something just because it doesn't make sense to you. The, there's a thought that it could be activating protective mechanisms like DNA damage repair, because normally cells will try and repair any DNA damage that happens, and that it overshoots, so it actually becomes protective. Um, it also, there are st people who support hormesis the, um, in radiation say there, are, there is no harm at doses under 100 millisieverts, which um, certainly from the studies I've seen, I think there is evidence that there is harm. Um, and generally speaking, it's not a concept that is supported by our regulatory agencies. So this is more the LNT, the linear no threshold hypothesis that is followed. And the idea is that all radiation is harmful, right down to zero. So even background radiation is making some of us sick. Again, it's a very low amount, um, but it is contributing to the background ex uh, baseline rates of cancer that we have. Um, the idea is that the, with the LNT, the risk is directly proportional to the dose, and um, it's, it's controversial, but generally, as I said, most radiological organizations and agencies worldwide accept the LNT right now. So I want to talk about this study. It's the lifespan study of Hiroshima survivors called the LSS. So this looked at 120,000 people after the big blast. Um, and they looked at them right up till about the year 2000. Now you have to remember that it's, it isn't really similar to what we have, which is a low level chronic exposure. It was one massive huge blast of mostly gamma radiation. Um, they did find increase of cancer which increased with the dose, they found a lot less than they expected. Um, they call it all these other illnesses it, they found increases in. And interestingly, the survivor's offspring conceived after the blast did not have an increase in birth, birth defects or cancer, which is very interesting also. However, there are problems with this study. Um, issues around what they used as a control group and who of those 120,000 people wasn't a random sample by any means. <coughs> Um, and that they were selective as to the information that they used for it. And I think mostly, impor most importantly, the first five years are missing. So all those people that died of radiation-related illness are not counted in this. And so you're tar starting out with a healthier cohort of people who are probably less naturally radiosensitive. Um, again, it's a one-time blast. And even though it doesn't really, is not really comparable, comparable to what we all have it as exposures, all, all safe levels today are derived from this study. So I'm going to talk a bit about the study. So Ursula Franklin, very famous Canadian engineer, she, back in the 60s, looked at strontium-90 levels in children's teeth. Um, the the half-life is very long, it's about 30 years. And she found that there was more leukemia in children who had more strontium, strontium in their teeth. And this was from the weapons testing in uh, in the 50s. So she, in her, um, in her studies of this, helped the, the US make a decision to stop above ground nuclear testing. 
It also prompted the Tooth Fairy Project, which is in the north east, it might be all over the states now, but it's centered in the northeast of the, of the United States, where they get people to send in their children's teeth as they fall out. They check them for different uh, radionuclides and then do studies about rates of leukemia and things like that. It's very interesting. A um, lot of criticism about the methodologies around the studies, etc. Um, but it's a very interesting concept. Then there are the Comer studies from the UK. So in the 80s, there were some anecdotes of a lot of kids living near the reactors in the UK um, getting leukemia. So they did some studies in the 90, 1980s and they found some possible links between living near a reactor and children getting leukemia. And this prompted this whole series, I think there are maybe 15 or 17 reports now since the 80s, is the Commission on Medical Aspects of Radiation in the Environment. So they did find some concerning findings about elevations of cancers and leukemias. The problem always is that the s populations are small around most nuclear reactors. In Canada, we are the only country that has built our reactors in the most populated area of the whole country. Most other countries don't do that. They build them out in the country, usually right along a shore, because they need the water. Um, so certainly with these, you've got rare illnesses in small populations, very hard to study and very hard to find epidemiological statistical significance. So, and this is what I mean by looking at the studies, is that you can have a bunch of studies that show elevations in something, but if they don't reach significance, and that's the statistical formula they use, usually because of small populations, then some people would consider it a negative study, but I don't think you should dismiss them. Um, so then a study came up in 2008 from Germany called the Kick Study, where unlike the studies before, which are what we call ecological studies, not a very solid kind of methodology where you just look at illness rates in a certain geographical area. This was a case control study which uh, methodologically is much more robust. And they were looking at childhood leukemia in children living near the 16 reactors in Germany, and they, f and they looked at it, the risk in different ra ra uh, radiuses around each reactor. And they found for children under five living within five kilometers, an elevated risk, statistically significant for every single uh, one of the 16 reactors. And this was a bit of a surprise that the, 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 it was such a, a clear relationship. Um, but again, they s the conclusion is there's no explanation for it, even though these uh, reactors are spewing out very small amounts, but certainly significant enough, perhaps, to trigger leukemia in a sensitive child, radiosensitive child, but that the, the doses were just too small to be, to, to be responsible for the leukemia increase. So it's left as being unexplained. <coughs> but this similar kind of study was replicated a couple, a couple of years ago in France. They did the same kind of study looking at the uh, rates of leukemia around each of their 19 reactors, but they also did dose estimates of how much actual um, radioactivity was, there was around each reactor. Um, and they did find an increase, risk, almost double of ch getting childhood leukemia in children under 15 living near within five kilometers again. Um, but they said it's not related to the radioactivity because the dose estimates weren't in sync with it. Um, there, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of criticism of how we measure doses. It's very hard to measure doses. Um, what they do is they have spot measurements, then there's all sorts of, they look at weather patterns, which way the wind's blowing, and they look at these sort of typical, hypothetical sort of man, woman, and child in different areas, uh, and how much they're eating and drinking, the, possible uh, contaminated food, etc. They're all estimates. They're not actually real measurements of real people. They're estimates. Um, so a lot of people dis dispute this whole study and say, well, because it's the doses don't match, then it's nothing to do with the radioactivity. But I would, I would again, having looked at the study, I would say I would question the estimates of their measurements of the doses. Now, in Canada, we've done very few studies. 
This is going back to 1989, where they looked at childhood leukemia rates near all Ontario nuclear facilities. They did not find any significant elevated <coughs> risk. Um, again, ecological study is not a very robust kind of study. And again, small numbers, particularly around Chalk River, Elliott Lake, and Bruce, not, you're not going to have a lot of kids getting leukemia, period. And you're, even an increase, you're, not, you're unlikely to find any statistically significant increase. But they did find increased levels of leukemia after opening Pickering compared to before. And they did find increased levels near Pickering and Bruce. And anyway, the conclusion was these are concerning findings. We should do more studies, which we actually haven't done. There's another study a couple of years later looking at tritium coming out of Pickering. Now, tritium is radioactive hydrogen. It's one of the products. We make a lot of it in our candy reactors. It's radioactive hydrogen, and it incorporates itself into water molecules and carbon, uh, carbon chains, etc., which <coughs> most of us are made up largely of water and carbon um, and hydrogen. So it's incorporating itself right into our molecules within our cells. Um, so they're looking at tritium releases from the Pickering nuclear station and birth defects and infant mortality, basically. So they're looking in the first year of life, 25 kilometer radius around Pickering. They also measured some tritium em emissions um, during the pregnancies of these infants. They did not find a significant elevation of any of these birth defects. However, looking at it when they compared it to tritium doses, they looked at, they did find central nervous system defects, mostly uh, neural tube, which is like, like spina bifida, that were elevated at the highest airborne tritium release level around Pickering. Um, they did find a non-significant increase in Down syndrome. And when they just looked at the prevalence, they did find a significant increase in Down syndrome around Ajax and Pickering. Again, the conclusion was that they need to do more studies, which again, we haven't really done. Um, until 2007, a very large study was done around Durham, which is where Darlington and Pickering are. So again, an ecological study looking at a lot of cancers and different congenital defects. They did find a significant, statistically significant elevation of leukemia and thyroid cancer, both known to be radiosensitive cancers in males. The combined cancer rate was increased after opening Darlington compared to before and there was a non-significant elevation of Down syndrome after opening both reactors. Again, there were lots of negative findings, but you have to worry about positive findings in, in, a, in a study like this. Um, they concluded, because of various ways of looking at things, that there are no patterns and that the radiation coming from the reactors is not causing any illness. Now, more recently, the uh, CNSC, I think, they, they did this study called Radiation Exposure and Cancer Incidents. Um, they were, looked at a radius of 25 kilometers around the Ontario uh, nuclear facilities and cancer rates. Again, they compared it to dose estimates. Again, they'll take, a, 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 they'll measure a few, do a few measurements and do a lot of modeling and making assumptions and plugging into computer formulas and coming up with doses. They concluded that the dosers are low and there's no increase in cancer due to radiation. But when you actually look at the study, again, the, the, those concerning studies from Germany and France were within five kilometers of the reactors. They're looking at 25 kilometers, so it's not surprising that, that if there is an increase, they're going to miss it. Um, again, I would question about whether the doses are accurate. Um, again, very hard to show significant increases, rare illnesses in small populations. And they, they did find a significant increase in thyroid cancer and leukemia, again, both radiosensitive cancers, uh, but they dismissed them for various reasons. And then a couple of years ago, also in, around, in Ontario, they did, uh, another group did a tritium study, an estimated cancer risk in relation to tritium exposure from routine operation of a nuclear generating station in Pickering. So they looked at a bunch of different cancers, adults and children, they com and they did the tritium dose estimate. And they concluded there was no risk of cancer due to tritium exposure. But there was a double significant increase in cancer in female children <coughs> aged 16 to 19. Um, and they dismissed this for various reasons. 
Um, another problem is that, again, the doses are estimates. And the European studies showed an increase in children under five, but this study only started at age six, and they lumped six to 19 all together. Um, they also, the control group, the group, they're com the group they're comparing to is a group that possibly has uh, exposure also. So, in conclusion, in Canada, mostly we have these ecological studies, we have small numbers and limitations due to the methodology we're using. There are some concerning increases in leukemia down syndrome and neural tube defects. We've never had a large case control study done here. But there are very good studies from Europe that show some concerning findings. Now, I just want to touch on this nuclear waste. I think somebody in the next few weeks is going to talk about this more. But this is a huge problem with this industry, is that creation of all this waste that we have no idea what to do with. So the Nuclear Waste Management Organization in Canada is what is responsible for this. Right now we have two million fuel bundles of spent fuel, each about 24 kilo, uh, kilograms, about the size of a fire log. And it's just sitting on the reactor sites. And so there are two things you can do with it. One is you just keep storing it there. And the other is to bury it deep under the ground in the Canadian Shield. And so this is what is being considered right now. Um, there's an area up in the Bruce Peninsula around King Carden that is, they're studying very seriously. Um, very expensive thing to do. But we have to do something with it. The problem is that nobody has ever done this before. And we don't know how this would work. So you're taking all this highly toxic radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, and you're, you're drilling a hole deep down, I don't know how deep it is, into rock, and you're going to store it down there, and then you're going to cover it up again, and you're going to cross your fingers that it's not going to leak into Lake Huron, which is right next to it, and which is the drinking water source for millions of people, and also out into the soil, uh, the groundwater. It's, it's just unprecedented, and we have no idea um, whether it, what would happen to it. Um, there's also the issue of transporting it. Again, are we going to take it down the 401? Are we going to use a train? Um, lots of concerns about transporting uh, highly toxic radioactive uh, spent fuel. And again, I'm just going to touch on this because a lot of speakers after this are going to be talking about weapons proliferation. So the spent fuel has plutonium and tritium in it. Tritium is what's used in the H-bomb. So that, along with plutonium, both are concerns in terms of weapons proliferation. The reactors themselves are a target for terrorist attacks. Uh, maybe if you just flew a plane right into the reactor, you'd get a massive explosion, who knows. But again, there's also the issue of nuclear war, which is alive and well. It did not go away when the Cold War ended. And I'm not going to say anything more except there's no meaningful medical response to a nuclear war. Doctors, healthcare systems can't deal with it it would be catastrophic. And then there's the issue of depleted uranium weapons, which I've talked about. So, nuclear accidents. And again, I think other people are going to be talking about this. I'm going to touch on a few here. An accident anywhere is an accident everywhere because the radionuclides from the fallout from these accidents go all over the world. So, Fukushima, almost four years ago now, four of their reactors uh, were working. There was an earthquake followed by a tsunami. The water system, you need that coolant constantly to cool everything and control um, the heat. Um, everything overheated. There was massive explosions, fires, and then meltdowns. Um, so that spent fuel gets so hot it actually melts down. Melts through into the containment, kind of the shell that these reactors are in. And the massive huge air plume, which eventually went around the world. No. Luckily, m Fukushima, like most reactors, is right on the ocean. So most of the radioactivity went out into the ocean. And, did not, and, and that's partly to do with weather patterns and things. And the plume went east. It didn't go southwest into much of Japan, luckily. Um, a lot of workers were exposed. Um, the water, air, soil, food, and fish locally became quite radioactive. With the measurements that they did take, they evacuated up to 20 kilometers um, around the Fukushima prefecture. Um, and then all these radionuclides were, were found within a few days, uh, actually all over the world, really. 
So they found it in traces in tap water and breast milk in Tokyo. And then it was found in Sweden and Austria and US. It, measurements all over the world. Milk in California, Vermont, drinking water in Philadelphia, and vegetables and fruits in California. So, um, and this is still going on. This is not a one-time thing. There is still a lot of concern about what's going on in Fukushima. Um, right now, you've got these reactors. Nobody can even go in and see what's going on because it's all this melt, melt down, melted, spent fuel is sitting there. And you ha they have to keep it cool because it has this tendency to heat up and you could have a massive explosion at any time. So they're, throw they're putting in 300 tons a day of water to cool it. When it comes out, it's contaminated. So there are about 1,000 big, huge concrete uh, storage tanks, which are all full now, and they're leaking. There's also the groundwater that's going in there, flushing through, and then going back out into the ocean. Um, there's ish, big issues with safety of the workers, and I, I won't get into a lot of detail, but TEPCO, which is Tokyo Electric, uh, Electric Power Company, who's responsible for all this, there's been huge criticism of TEPCO from the very beginning about <coughs> not admitting to the, how bad everything was and still is, lack of transparency, refusal to have any help from the rest of the world, and a lot of questionable studies on the health that um, are saying that everything's okay and nobody's having any problems with radiation illnesses. So what's happening now? Again, it's very hard to find any studies on this. They, d they have been doing ultrasounds of children's thyroids, but there's a lot of um, confusion as to what the results are showing. The government is saying one thing, other people are saying no. Um, there are a lot of children, there are children getting thyroid cancer, and there are a lot more with nodules and cysts. There's questions of the size of the cysts and what's worrisome and what's not. Um, and they're, they're not letting parents pay privately to do the ultrasound. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of confusion about this. Um, a lot of anecdotes about birth defects and Down syndrome and all sorts of people with multiple symptoms, and again, thyroid cancer children. There's also the reactor four, which apparently is on its is not stable and there's a lot of concern that it's going to collapse. So, then the UN Scientific Committee on Environmental Aspects of Radiation, they did a report, the 2013 report, which came out in 2014, um, looking at health, um, health effects, and their, their conclusion is that any increase in overall cancer rates among residents due to fallout from the accident is unlikely. This was met with a lot of criticism about their methodology and their not being transparent and not doing studies properly. And part of it is that WHO, which is World Health Organization, which is the health branch of the UN, in 1959 made an agreement with the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, very pro-nuclear group, that they would consult them about any studies that they did about health and radiation. So basically they have kept quiet about any health effects of radiation since 1959. Um, and that may be why there, there's so much criticism of this report. Just a word about Chernobyl. Back in 1986, a level seven accident, which actually the only other one that reached that was Fukushima eventually, the worst accident in history. Some people say Fukushima is worse now. Um, very uh, 200,000 times the strength of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, contaminated worldwide. Um, 350,000 people were evacuated. Um, now, how many people died? T total question mark. Initially, in 1994, this study said that there were 31 deaths and they were all radiation workers. Then, UNSCEAR, the same group as the Fukushima report, said that, well, maybe it was 64 and not 31. And then this group, the IAEA, actually did a different, looked at some different studies and estimates and said it could have reached 4,000. And then Greenpeace did its own study. Um, and there was another group called, uh, another one called Torch, which is the other report on Chernobyl. <coughs> and they both ended up saying 30 to 60,000 excess cancer deaths, as many as 200,000. 
due to Chernobyl. And then this first man there, Alexei Yablokov, he was the um, Russian, the founder of Russian Greenpeace. And he, they t looked at a lot more studies and they came, they concluded that almost a million premature deaths due to Chernobyl. Now, um, they included a lot more studies, very, very controversial. People say that a lot of the studies shouldn't be used, they weren't peer reviewed, they weren't um, reliable, methodology was bad, etc. So it, again, like lots of things, you're just gonna have to choose who you believe. But it is very controversial as to how many people actually died from Chernobyl. Um, and this is a uh, physicist who said nuclear power is safe only if no act of God is permitted because accidents do happen. So I'm just going to talk a little bit um, about the nuclear, the above grounds nuclear weapons testing in the 50s. So this was done all over the world. Particularly important to us is the what was done in Nevada. Um, so the uh, you, you inhale or ingest or absorb this through the skin. Now the major ones are iodine-131, cesium-137, and strontium-90. So iodine-131 is half-life of eight days, so it's very short. When, it, when, it, when you uh, absorb it, it's, it's, half of it's gone in eight days. It's a beta emitter, so it's an internal emitter. It accumulates in your thyroid, because it's iodine. causes thyroid cancer, thyroiditis. And this is where having iodine tablets ready for an accident is important. So, so they, the, your regular iodine will flood your thyroid so that the radioactive iodine doesn't get there. And to their credit, the CNSC, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, has last year decided that they would mail to every family living, and I can't remember the radius around Pickering, every family would have at the ready <coughs> iodine tablets. Um, and I can't remember how many. I think you, could, you need them every 24 hours. But anyway, so that's iodine. Um, so cesium, long half-life. It's a beta and a gamma emitter. The, the body mistakes it for potassium. It pools in your muscles and your brain. If you eat meat from a cow that's been exposed, you will be eating cesium-137, and it causes cancer. Strontium-90, again, a long half-life. It's an internal emitter, beta. And the body mistakes it for calcium, so it pools in your bones and your teeth, causing bone cancer, bone marrow issues like leukemia, and cancer of the soft tissues that are near the bone. And again, the Tooth Fairy Project is looking at uh, a lot of, uh, doing a lot of studies on strontium-90 in children's teeth. So the National Cancer Institute of the US looked at iodine-131 effect from the, the, the testing in Nevada. Um, this is the study that they did in 2006. So again, these are all just dose estimates. There are actually very few measurements that they did after each of these tests. And then they, again, lots of modeling. They have your hypothetical man, woman, child, baby. And then they looked at wind patterns, etc. And these are the estimates of the doses, okay? So the red is really high dose and the blue is less. Uh, Nevada is in the southwest there, so most of it was north and east, mostly due to wind patterns, the exposures. But it was measured all over the country. So what it, the, the way people were exposed mostly was they land, the iodine 131 landed on the grass, the cows ate the grass, and it got into their milk, and the people drink the milk, particularly children. Again, lots of estimates and assumptions and modeling um, and they admit they might be out by a factor of three in terms of the exposures. They figured 55 million people under the age of 20 were, f were ex first exposed in 1952. And they estimate that up to 200,000 excess thyroid cancers can be expected over their lifetimes. Now, thyroid cancer is going up all the time. Whether it's from this, um, there's no way to tell. But the average exposure over the country was two RADs. Now, one 0.1 rad is one millisievert, which is what we're all uh, not supposed to have more than that. So two rads is 20 times that. That was the average, but there was a huge range, right down from 0.1, which is one millisievert, right up to 16 rads, which is many, many, many times what we would consider a safe level. Um, and again, children more more susceptible than adults. Um, so just to be complete, 
and because I'm a physician, I want to talk about the exposures that um, you get with medical procedures. So they're medical isotopes, and these are um, <coughs> tracers, basically. So you get injected with it, and then you, it follows different parts of your body, and then you take pictures or measure it. Um, but they are radioactive, mostly short-lived. Um, <coughs> you also get them with x-rays, particularly CT scans, which are kind of lots of x-rays put in a 3D way. Um, and remember, all exposures are cumulative. Children and women are more vulnerable. And keep in mind, the allowable is one millisievert per year. So about half of the, that for Americans is from <coughs> medical procedures, mostly CT scans. Um, just a word about someone called Al Stewart, who was a doctor in the, I think the 50s or 60s, who was concerned about pregnant women getting x-ray. And she showed that their children, by age 10, had a double the risk of developing leukemia. And she thought it was from the x-rays. And she, she was laugh, a laughing stock from this. But actually, they realized after a while that this was true. And at a certain point, it's not recommended that pregnant women get x-rays. But anyway, the biological effects of ionizing radiation, this is an American, these are American, this is an American organization that does these studies, say that one in a thousand people receiving 10 millisieverts will develop cancer from it. One in 500 women, one six sixty men, will develop cancer if they have a CT of the abdomen at age 20. One in 550 if a child does. And one in 1,500 children that get a CT of their head will develop cancer from it. So how much radiation is this? So keep in mind, 1.0 is what we're allowed to have. A mammogram is 0.4, so it's almost half your yearly amount. A DEXA is the bone density, very little. So the extremity x-rays are very little. Bone density, hand, foot, knee, shoulder, and dental um, x-rays uh, are apparently very little. But a chest x-ray is one-tenth your yearly allowance, and uh, skull, pelvic, abdominal um, are, um, or certainly pelvic, abdominal, and hip are mo most, uh, most of what you're allowed in one year. The low back is one and a half times, and people get a lot of low back x-rays because a lot of people have back pain. So the CT scans are the real culprits here. So just look at those numbers, and these are many, many, many times the allowable, the yearly allowable amount. Now, everything is risk-benefit. So if you are going to discover a, a cancer that's there and be able to treat it and be cured, et cetera, then that's probably worth it. I do have a concern that a lot of physicians have, aren't thinking this way. They don't consider the risk of, this, of the test when they're ordering it. Um, so my medical isotopes, so a thyroid scan, almost double the year, yearly amount. Um, the next one is looking for pancreatic problems. Um, bone scan, and then all the heart tests, coronary angiography, nuclear stress tests, CT angiograms, and then the last one, 15 times. Now, if that's going to save you from dying of a heart attack, well, that's okay. probably worth it. But you have to keep in mind the risk, and that's my concern, is that I don't think people are fully aware of the risk. Um, our responsibility, meaning physicians, we need to keep this in mind, we need to inform ourselves, and possibly there should be something in our electronic medical records to keep track of this, and always keep in mind the risk benefit. So this is just a quick summary of the health effects, uranium mining and the refining and all that, the emissions from reactors and all the studies that, some of them sh show some concerning findings, nuclear waste, and risk of accidents, nuclear war, which is sort of goes without saying it's not good for your health, and then um, medical procedures. So that's everything I have to say. Any questions or comments, discussions? <laughs>